Talmudim Way, adding cultural, historic, and geographic significance to your walk as a disciple of Jesus. John chapter 2, verse 13 through 4, verse 4, we're calling In Jerusalem, and really the the whole title is In Jerusalem and In Judea. Then when we get to chapter 4, it's going to be In Samaria. So we've got the Acts 1, verse 8 of trilogy going here, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Acts 17.11 reminds us to trust but verify. And it's interesting, in the series, The Chosen, they placed the meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus in Capernaum. And um, I'd always been taught and always believed that that meeting took place in Jerusalem. I still think it does take place in Jerusalem, but it's interesting that the text of John chapter 3 doesn't say where the meeting took place. Um, by, by context, before and after, he's in Jerusalem and Judea. So I think it makes sense to put the meeting in um, Jerusalem. But it was interesting that the, the directors of that series took a different tactic. So it's not, not to say that they're wrong, but when we're a Berean, we check things out. And uh, it was interesting to learn that it didn't say that the meeting specifically took place in Jerusalem. So we always learn something. Now our blessing, God, we praise you for your intricately designed word, which teaches us how to follow you as disciples. Now guard our minds and our hearts, draw us closer to you as we study that we may become uh, Talmudim disciples that are doers of your word and not just hearers only. Give us that Acts 1711 discernment and uh, a heart to seek you in Jesus name. Amen. Got a lot to cover here. There's no good place to break it up, so we'll just uh, bite off this uh, this larger chunk here. We'll look at the geographic setting of the end of chapter 2 and chapter 3. Um, and then in Jerusalem, we'll start with, the in chapter 2, the temple cleansing. And our one question we'll want to ask is, is this the same cleansing that Matthew and Luke record at the end of Jesus' ministry? Is this the same thing happening here, or is this a separate event? Um, I tend to think it's the same one, but uh, I might be in the minority on that, but I'll I'll tell you why I think that. Um, the uh, leadership asked Jesus, what signs do you show us? And I think we tend to read that as what signs, you know, show us your signs. But what may be going on here is the establishment is telling Jesus, show us your signs, meaning submit your authority for our approval, and then we'll let you know. Um, there might be that going on here. And then John chapter 3, the famous uh, meeting with Nicodemus at night where Jesus will lead into John chapter 3, verse 16, the uh, most famous verse in the New Testament, the serpent in the wilderness, uh, kind of leads into all that. So we'll look at that. The general theme of light versus darkness is running through this entire passage. So it's not something we don't want to miss is that contrast that the John, the gospel writer, is building there. And then we'll end with in Judea. There's a, dis a dialogue between John the Baptist disciples and, and one of Jesus' disciples that leads to an interesting uh, statement by John the Baptist. So let's go ahead and jump in. The previous lesson ended with Jesus staying at Capernaum up in the Sea of Galilee for a few days, and then verse 13 of chapter 2 says Jesus is going to the Passover in Jerusalem, and that's uh, that's box 5 here. So what Jesus probably likely did was come down the Jordan River and then come to Jericho, and then there's a uh, a well-traveled road that leads right up into Jerusalem. And then in uh, chapter 4, it's, it says he has to go through Samaria, so he will take the, uh, the hilly uh, route through the center of the country. The end of chapter 2 has Jesus in Jerusalem for the feast, and then at the end of chapter 3, uh, Jesus has the uh, John has the Jesus and the disciples in the Judean countryside, and they name these towns of Anon near Salim, which is up here uh, circled. Now, it's interesting that that's, this area is actually Samaria, not Judea, but um, it is one possible location for where this meeting of the um, Bap uh, disciples of John the Baptist and the disciple of Jesus took place. We're heading into Jesus's public ministry. So we've spent the first part of the series looking at his pre-ministry and then moved into uh, his baptism and then the, the wedding at Cana. Now we're moving into this the part of the Gospels that have these exchanges, these dialogues, where Jesus is really teaching and explaining who he is to other people. Some of these will be just instructional. Jesus is teaching, like Sermon on the Mount, like the picture you see here from the Chosen. We've got the people listening, seated on the ground, then we've got some of the disciples in back, and then we've got a Roman soldier kind of keeping an eye on, on the whole thing. Um, I encourage you to put yourself 
in the narrative and kind of ask how you would have reacted if you were any one of the people. Um, there's Jesus, the disciples, Pharisees, there's silent onlookers. So you can ask, in, in what ways am I like Jesus in the story? Now, we're not Jesus, but we are called to imitate him. So what was he feeling? What was he thinking? How am I like the disciples in good and bad ways? How am I like the Pharisees in good and bad ways? Um, what would I have thought had I been the Roman soldier in this? I mean, so look at it from different perspectives. Um, imagine you're, you were the Roman soldier listening to the Sermon on the Mount. What would you have taken away? And and then is there anything in the story that caught you off guard, especially when taken from one of the various points of view? And then really to, to bring it home to application, what is Jesus teaching me? about my walk with him because i think at any one point we are all of these people right we're the uh the the newbie be people being taught or the the maybe more seasoned disciples still not quite there yet but trying to learn um sometimes we're the doubting you know angry centurion in the background there uh so we're, we're all of these people and i think all of these people have lessons for us so what is jesus teaching me about my walk with him and then how does this truth affect my relations with others these are all great questions to ask as we move through these um, these gospel narratives John chapter 2, verse 13, the Passover of the Eudaioi was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So just a reminder that uh, when you see Jews in John's gospel, it's very flexible, and, and here the term Eudaioi means a, a, a component of the Jewish religion. So one thing is, why doesn't John just say Passover, right? Why does he specifically say Passover of the Jews? Uh, Lazorkin speculates that this is to differentiate from other Passover. So you see in your picture, even today, the Samaritans, a small group of them, um, celebrate Celebrate the Samaritan Passover. It's a little bit different. Um, they have a little bit different set of beliefs, but it is a, a different kind of Passover. Um, according to the Torah, all able-bodied Jewish males were expected to attend Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacle. So um, Jesus was um, fulfilling the law right here. And so note John has this episode at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, where the other three will have it at the very end. So interesting to contrast that. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their table. So it's important to note that the sheep and the pigeons were needed for the sacrifices uh, and money changers were needed because all the people from all over the world would be bringing their own currency. So we needed all these things. The problem was the profiteering based on the monopoly that these people had created and they were, you know, gouging the people. Um, symbolically here, John is offering evidence that the temple is unfit for proper uh, for proper worship because it's being controlled by apostate. So all that theme of the unworthy um, leaders are, is running through this section here. Um, the problem is treating something common that was supposed to be holy. And there's a lot of examples in the uh, Old Testament about this. One that comes to mind is when uh, David is returning the ark um, from uh, Kiriath Jerim, he, there's a guy that puts his hand on the ark and touches it, and he's struck dead. And you're thinking, well, that was kind of harsh. But what he was doing was he he wasn't following God's rule. So God has, when it comes to his worship, he has a specific way that uh, things are supposed to go, and you know it is not our <laughs> position to change any of those. So remember, as we look, as we accuse these money changers, we need to look in the mirror and ask what ways might we be doing some of these things? Might might we be treating holy things as common? And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And this is a picture of the a whip of cords from about 1500 BC from, uh, from Egypt. When a New Testament writer quotes a portion of a verse, uh, we're at a bit of a disadvantage because we, we just see the verse that he's questioning. But really, uh, for the original audience, they would have memorized the entire passage. So John has the disciples here recalling all of Psalm 69. Now, if we just read verse 9 out of context, it looks like something triumphant, right? Zeal for your house has consumed me. But in context, the entire psalm is about suffering. Um, verse 9 continues, zeal for 
for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So there is a a undercurrent of uh, sadness working through this statement here. Um, 69 verse 14, deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up, or its pit close its mouth over me. So you can see this uh, very dire circumstance here. It ends, draw near to my soul, redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. So after Jesus' death, the disciples were able to put the pieces together. And I think this is one possible clue that the, the sadness of this this uh, tone here that they're referencing might be a hint that this only occurred at the end of his ministry immediately prior to his death. Also, house is the temple, but in, and also in a larger sense, it's the world. So John 3.16 is going to talk about God so loved the world. John places the temple event here, I think, to frame and then uh, lead into the discussion with Nicodemus about how God loved the world and, and really zeal for the world will consume Jesus as well because he'll lay down his life. Just to contrast the uh, the Luke account, which is at the end. Uh, so basically, after the triumphal entry, then Jesus heads into the temple. And, and as he entered the temple, began to drive out those who uh, sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So what the disciples remember Jesus saying, according to John's narrative, is very different from what the synoptists record. They are referencing here Isaiah 56, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And then Jeremiah 7, uh, my house has become a den of robbers in your eyes. So they're putting these two together. And in the picture there is uh, some of the shops uh, that occupied uh, near the temple by the big staircase there and that provided access to the temple courts. They, uh, this is where people would have bought uh, you know, the necessary um, animals and whatnot for the sacrifices. So the Udayoi said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Udayoi then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Chapter 2 began with, on the third day, there was the wedding in Cana. So we have this literary style called inclusio, and that's really bookending a passage with identical or similar words and phrases. So we've got three days in the beginning of the passage and then three days here at the end of the passage. So possibly what's going on here. Herod's renovations uh, made the Jewish temple one of the most magnificent buildings in the ancient world. And even in Luke 21, the disciples say, wow, what, what magnificent structure this is. Jesus then prophesies not, not one stone will be left upon another. And then we can see a fulfillment of that. And I've got a picture of that on the next slide. Um, Jesus is not talking about that, though. He's talking about our bodies as the temple, his body as a temple specifically. Uh, and that's a theme that Paul will develop later in his, uh, in his letters. So Jesus is probably not pointing to the destruction of the temple, at least the way John is reckoning it. He does do so elsewhere, and that destruction would eventually happen. Archaeologists excavated this area in the 1990s and uh, left these stones in place as a, as a testimony to the destruction in AD 70. So these are stones that were thrown down from the top and, and ended up on the bottom. And what's cool about this, this is one place in Jerusalem where you can literally touch the little prophecy here. So when it says he's having this exchange with the, the Jews or the Udaioi, they're probably the Sadducees here, or we might want to say the temple establishment. Pharisees did not control the temple, and they probably would have agreed with Jesus that it had been become corrupted. So uh, probably Sadducees going on here. Dr. Eli, as I said in the beginning, when we say show us, we, we put the emphasis on us. So not show us, but show us why you do these things. In other words, Jesus, submit to our authority and we'll tell you whether these signs are valid. So Jesus is not one to cast pearls before swine. So he's very selective in whom he tells about the kingdom and, and who, to whom he shows these things. But it's interesting that they say, show us. And the very next chapter, Jesus is about to show one of them in John chapter 3. So by, by title and status, Nicodemus was uh, a member of the elite, uh, although... Um, my personal suspicion is that Nicodemus was uh, a little bit different, had a little bit different uh, outlook on things. 
Um, again, so my suspicion here is all of this is the same event at the end of his ministry. We're going to see at the end of chapter 3 that Jesus appears anxious to avoid attention. So to me, it just doesn't seem logical that he would poke the bear here in Jerusalem by overturning the table and then want to keep a low profile once he's out in the countryside. That just doesn't make sense here. Um, John is weaving together a different kind of story, and that's a story that doesn't require strict chronology. So he's he's trying to make various points about Jesus that uh, by, by taking different aspects of his ministry, um, he's weaving, weaving a, a tale of his version of the gospel. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. So you've got the contrast with the, uh, the establishment doesn't believe him. They asked to see more signs, and then the people uh, are believing him. Uh, on your picture is a, a Passover Seder, a, tip, a traditional Jewish uh, meal, and it's a, a, a ceremony that Jewish families have done for ages. Um, each element in the service has some significance to remind the participants of God's grace, and there's a whole uh, liturgy that they read called a a, a seder and an order of movement and there's questions and, and all that it's a really neat uh, neat ceremony but jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man now uh, flow right into chapter three now there was a man of the pharisees named nicodemus a ruler of the Eudaioid. this man came to jesus by night and said to him rabbi we know that you are a teacher come from god for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So just remember that the chapter breaks are man's insertions. They're not divinely inspired. And really chapter two flows very nicely right into chapter three. So we've got these this talk about the signs. We've got a man and then a man named Nicodemus who is asking about, you know, it's talking about signs. So it, it flows very nicely here. Uh, at the end of chapter two, basically Jesus has no interest in a large following of fans. He, he wants committed followers and he is um, answering himself to the Lord only. John is really attesting to Jesus's divinity. So Jesus knows what thoughts are in man's heart, just like he had with Nathaniel. Uh, you know, he, he knew when he was under the fig tree, these things that only God can know is what, is what Jesus knows. So note, we talked about the word eudioid, not always used negatively. And if you've got a, a negative impression of Pharisee, that, that is also not used negatively right here. Uh, Nicodemus was a good guy. Um, he had uh, some things to sort out, but he was not an enemy of Jesus. So not all Pharisees are bad. Not all Romans are bad. Um, there are good and bad people. There are good and bad Pharisees, good and bad Romans. Um, just like there are good and bad people today who claim to be followers of Jesus. It's, we need to judge people individually by their words and their actions and not by some label that they are given. So when we think of by night, uh, our, our minds tend to jump to some you know secret dark alley meeting. Um, the Chosen actually portrays it as, as on the rooftop, and that's a very plausible um, um, outcome there. Uh, it could have been after a busy day. So you know if people had things to do during the day, then then dinner time um, after the sunset was would might have been a nice time to do something like this. That time of year, the sunset uh, right around seven o'clock uh, in the early spring. So it may not have been necessarily late in the evening. Thing, but kind of you know after dinner time kind of thing passover is always during a full moon so there would have been plenty of natural light if if we assume this occurs in jerusalem around the time of the passover the bible also doesn't say that nicodemus was alone and so he might have had some of his own disciples there and they're all kind of taking it in so it's just interesting we, we can't necessarily assume that it was just a a one-on-one -on -one meeting although um that's that's certainly fair to, to think that Nicodemus here is an elder, so the fact that he refers to Jesus as rabbi is probably quite significant. Uh, we do know later in John's gospel that he has an uneasy relationship with the other leader. So there's something different about this guy, um, Nicodemus. And so he's, again, trying to sort things out, and um, you know that might explain why he's uh, having a holding meeting at night. In any case, that he came by night is very, very deliberately portraying Nicodemus as symbolic of the world. We all begin in darkness. We all begin in the night. And then it's God himself who brings us into the light. So just as uh, we can envision Nicodemus' transition uh, progression from you know, clueless darkness into understanding and light. Really, John's whole gospel is is all about darkness and light, and even his letters um, are <laughs> continue those themes about darkness and light. 
So in a roundabout way, Nicodemus is really asking, you're the Messiah, aren't you? <laughs> and so Jesus is going to answer that. Yes, yes, amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. So remember, Nicodemus was not a newbie, very educated. These are two highly intelligent, deeply committed Jews debating a, a core essence of the Judaism of their day. Um, Nicodemus is often depicted as being clueless as to Jesus' meaning and struggling to keep up. And, and that may be true, but uh, we'll see on the next slide. I've got some quotes from the Talmud. Uh, he may just be answering Jesus using Talmudic style language filled with metaphor and hyperbole. Um, in a sense, he's saying, I'm already Jewish. You know, why do I need to undergo conversion? Um, and, you know, why would I need to do that? So let's let's look at some of that on the next slide. This uh, picture was photographed at the tourist site, and it's called Yardinit on the uh, Jordan River right by the Sea of Galilee, and it's a, a common baptismal site. So born again was the Jewish expression for a Gentile believer formally converting to Judaism, and, and this is a ceremony that would have culminated with a full body immersion to what we would call a baptism. Um the, these two quotes are from the Talmud. When he comes up after his immersion, he is deemed to be an Israelite in all respects. And the next quote, one who has become a proselyte is like a child emerging from the womb, newly born. So this the concept of born again uh, in Nicodemus's mind was all about a Gentile converting to uh, to Judaism. So Nicodemus is saying, well, why do I need to do this? I'm already Jewish. Um, so after Nicodemus questions the first statement, we might say Jesus doubles down using even more extreme word pictures. Uh, he also does this in John 6 regarding eating his flesh and drinking his blood. So he kind of uh, goes for it and, and really makes a strike. Um, striking analogy. So Jesus is saying, you may have been physically born Jewish, but right standing with God is not inherited physically. There must be a spiritual transformation um, that is the same lines as when a Gentile undergoes conversion to Judaism. And so remember, this is mind-blowing for Nicodemus. So Jesus is, is undoing a core presupposition. And I would guarantee you that you and I also have presuppositions that we need to let Jesus undo the same thing. So uh, we just need to be open to what Jesus is saying and not not bring our filters, uh, try to remove those as much as possible and really get at the core of what Jesus is teaching. Because I think there are, Jesus has mind-blowing things for us, no matter how long we've been a believer, um, just reading the Bible anew every time can can open your eyes to things that you never saw before. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And remember, the, the Hebrew and Greek words for spirit and wind are synonymous of the same thing. And so in Hebrew, it would be ruach. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. So to Jesus, the need for spiritual regeneration should have been self-evident. But as time went on, uh, people began to think they were just on the team. If you're Jewish, then you're on the team. And by the way, uh, I think this is absolutely true in many parts of the church today. So let, let us not be pointing fingers. <laughs> if we do, remember, we have three pointing back at us. So we say, I go to church. Well, I was baptized. You know, I don't go to church, but the Lord and I have an understanding. Or I'm a good person. Um, you know, how about I believe in Jesus, yet uh, my works do not back up my words. So again, and all these people may think that they're on the team, but remember those uh, sad words, depart from me, I never knew you, um, were all said to people who were very surprised to hear those words. So we need to remember that it's not anything we do that puts us on the team, but it's it's our belief and, and following in Jesus. Um, it's often taught that this is evidence of Jesus starting a new religion here. I would just caution that uh, Christianity as a separate religion didn't happen for at least another hundred years after this. This is a conversation between two very uh, committed Jews, um, and you know, Nicodemus doesn't ever forsake his Jewishness to follow Jesus. So it's, uh, I, with all due respect, <laughs> I think those scholars are not correct. Uh, we talked before about an anachronism, uh, and I think that's kind of what that thought is, is uh, born out of here, thinking that Jesus is talking about a you know, foregoing Judaism and switching to Christianity. Not happening. 
So remember the beginning of the exchange. Jesus said, I, Nicodemus told Jesus, I know, we know that you have come from God. So Jesus is going to elaborate on that. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. Remember, he's come from God, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the Son of Man. So Jesus is speaking about heaven and eternal life in this passage, and he is saying he is a witness. And a witness's testimony is only valid if he has first-hand knowledge of that uh, to which he is testifying. So Jesus could testify about this life because he has it. He has eternal life. Um, John established this back in chapter 1. So go back and reread chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 14, about the pre-existent one uh, who, who came to earth and, and dwelt among us. In John's chronology, Nicodemus, the religious teacher, the Pharisee, part of the establishment, is the first person to whom Jesus revealed this. So that's uh, that's significant. And, and also remember Nicodemus' question, how can these things be? Jesus is, is answering that question. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So only son uh, definitely recalls Genesis 22 and Abraham's near offering of Isaac. Uh, God calls to Abraham and says, take your son, your only son, uh, whom you love. And so that's that that sacrifice uh, is, is running through there. John 3.16 is famous precisely because of the fact that it really requires no additional insight or commentary to understand. It's very sim- simple, uh, but but not <laughs> not simplistic. Um, very concise way of stating the gospel message. This is a picture uh, on Mount Nebo, which is the traditional place where Moses died. Uh, They have created this metallic sculpture that reminds us of the episode in Numbers 21, where the Israelites uh, exercised faith by looking upon the bronze serpent uh, to be healed of their fatal snake bites. And so it starts with verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. The people then repented and asked Moses to intervene. And then the Lord came up with what is really a strange remedy. In in verse 8, make a bronze serpent, set it on a standard. It shall come about that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So again, Remember, this is a people who were told to have no graven images, and they were definitely not to bow down and revere any graven images. So this is a very odd procedure, to be sure. Um, We might say, though, that the purpose is not fully understood until you get to John 3, um, because John uh, is saying, Jesus is saying, just as that serpent was in the wilderness lifted up, um, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So just as those who looked upon the serpent were physically healed, those who will look upon the Son of Man will also be spiritually healed. And so after the crucifixion, we can see that Jesus might have been speaking of his, his crucifixion and resurrection. However, uh, it's you can't by any stretch think that Jesus wanted Nicodemus to understand that. It just hadn't happened yet. So probably what Nicodemus understood was that just as those who look to the serpent on the pole receive life instead of death, those who look to Messiah and believe in him will be born again and have eternal life instead of death. Our memory verse, probably an easy one for most of us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And boy, that is a great verse to memorize. There's actually debate about whether uh, verse 16 through 21 is still Jesus speaking to Nicodemus or whether it's John's commentary kind of uh, wrapping up the uh, uh, the discussion. Supporters of the latter view note the similarity between this passage and John chapter 1, where we've got this, uh, whoever believes in him is not condemned, whoever does not believe is condemned already. That just sounds a lot like John. So I'll go ahead and read. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that he, so that it may be clearly seen 
that his works have been carried out in God. So again, we've got this tie-in between light and darkness. Uh, there's Dead Sea Scrolls also use that reference, so it would have been very clear um, for, for that audience to understand this: the evil, good, light, dark, um, all of that is happening here. Here's a picture of uh, Jerusalem at night. And of course, in Jesus' day, it would not have been quite this well lit. Although if it was a full moon on a clear night, it would have been um, you know, somewhat lit up by the light of the moon. It's interesting, a, a quick Greek lesson here. We often hear that the word agape means God's perfect love. And as a noun, that may be true, but not necessarily as a verb. Because verse 19 here reads, men agapeo the darkness rather than light. So uh, their deeds are evil. So I think it's better to think of agape as to be totally given over to, to be devoted to that kind of way. So we, we ask, are you totally and completely given over to God, you know, or do we give part to God and, and save part for the world? And unfortunately, most days I'm in the latter category, but it is something that we need to work on to be totally given over to God and, and not the things of this world. So note the design of this passage. This passage begins uh, at the end of verse uh, chapter two with a dark heart and then pr progresses into the meeting with Nicodemus that's in the literal darkness. The passage ends with the truth and light of God. And so as a literary form, this type of bracketing is very, very common. Um, so John's point here is that the believer passes from death to life, from darkness into the light. So that's kind of where he is. He's uh, wrapping up this discussion. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because the water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Udayoin, a single Udayoin, over purification. Here's a picture of where this region, uh, where this meeting might have taken place. Um, note, though, the themes of purification, living water, and spirit. They, again, they run all through the early chapters of John. So we have chapter 1, the waters of baptism. Chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, the stone jars of purification. And then later we have the cleansing and purifying of the temple. Maybe why John put that uh, episode at the end of chapter 2. Chapter 3, the, the discussion being born of water and spirit. And then now this discussion with verse 22. Chapter 4, the woman at the well, the discussion of living water. Chapter 5, we're going to see uh, this, this man who's at the pools of Bethesda. And what those are, we believe, are is a false healing center. Um, so we've got these false waters versus the, the true Jesus who can bring true restoration and purification. And there are also references to purification by water in uh, chapter 7, 9, 13, and 19. So it really uh, is a theme that will run all throughout John's gospel. John is pointing out here that Jesus is, is the ceremonially pure one. Again, in contrast to the, the general world at large and then particularly the defiled temple establishment. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. And this is a picture of the uh, probable location of Jesus' baptism um, outside of Jericho. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. And, and we looked at this earlier when we saw the disciples, uh, two of them. He, he, John is pointing to Jesus, saying there, there is the Son of God. Here he's describing his role in the form of a parable. So he's got the the bride would be Israel, and the groom would be Messiah. So that's that's who's getting married here. The friend of the groom would be John. Um, bringing the bride to the groom would be John's ministry of immersion and repentance and all of this about the Jewish wedding that we looked at previously. The voice here would be Jesus's call or Jesus going public with his ministry. And so basically what John is saying that my role is only to prepare Israel for her Messiah and then my role is to step aside. 
John did not want his works to overshadow Jesus. So while uh, possibly John's and Jesus' disciples here were <laughs> trying to get a rivalry going here, John is not at all interested in, in this type of dispute. So John is not only not upset, he is joyful, right? Weddings are supposed to be joyful. And so John has the absolute right attitude here. Verse 30, though, is an important one for us as Talmudim. It is not about us. He must increase but I must decrease. And, and if we're ambassadors for Jesus, we have to put his interests first and ours second. And so that leads us to the walking in his dust, um, just like we looked at last time. Like John, we demonstrate humility and keep our eyes on God's bigger picture. And so our, our uh, New Testament uh, epistle verses, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. He who comes from uh, above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one receives his testimony. Yet whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So again, uh, here is another instance where John, apparently, John the Gospel writer, apparently breaks off from quoting someone else, and then he's adding in his own commentary. And in fact, if you pick up uh, verse 21 and then follow that with verse 31, it, the words flow really nicely. Uh, so John is apparently just kind of adding in his own uh, uh, commentary here. So John again picks up the theme of the preexistent one, the one he established in chapter 1. Um, this thought of a, a seal, uh, he sets a seal to this as like a, a notary stamp of authentication. Authentication. So again, this this is a witness testimony, trial documents, affidavit. You know, all of that happening here. Um, very firm and and very uh, very much able to be believed. We take a passage such as the Spirit without measure. We kind of take that for granted, but that was not necessarily a simple topic in uh, in Jesus' day. In Psalm fifty one, David could pray. Take not your spirit from me. Um, if we have been sealed by the spirit, as described by the apostolic documents, we actually cannot pray this prayer, and nor would it ever occur to us to do so. But in, in that day, before uh, Acts chapter 2, only the thought was only the righteous could merit the spirit. And in a grand sense, that's still true. That's that's very true. But we, 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 we are righteous through Jesus. Um, but again, the concept of authorization is, is present in John's gospel. The son is the fully authorized representative of the Father. That's the main theme that John is communicating here. So for God to give the Spirit without measure, that would have been just another seismic shift in their thinking. And so note that there's a difference between believe and obey. Uh, whoever believes the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see. So there's more um, to belief than just intellectual assent, right? We've got to follow up with our works. And um, you know, the, the, the saying is, if you were on trial for a Christian, you know, would, for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And then again, I don't think there should be a chapter break here, but we'll just uh, lead into next time. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So the, this chapter breaks again, unfortunate, because we view them as a scene shift, but I think John is continuing this thread. Uh, everything ties together. The son, who is the father's authenticated representative, gives the spirit without measure. And we talked about how that's, you know, it's now going to be poured out on <laughs> more than just Jews. And the very next passage is going to be Jesus is passing through Samaria. So Jesus is going to widen the people's narrow view of who is eligible to receive the Spirit. And again, I think if we're honest, you know, we we think the same, right? We 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 think believers are all exactly like us and they think like us when actually the, the wide um, 
disparity of believers uh, and practices would, would probably startle us if we you know we would wonder if they're saved and they would probably wonder if we're saved but we're all one body as as the passage says um so we're going to find out next time why jesus had to pass through samaria and so i'll cut it off here ran a little long but we had a lot to get through so we'll look at next time the woman at the well in john chapter 4 we hope you've enjoyed this lesson for more information, find us on the web, www.talmudimway.org.